Working conditions at Sports Direct are like a Victorian workhouse, according to MPs. Their report accuses the company of failing to treat its staff like humans. Some workers earn less than the minimum wage and others were penalised for taking breaks to drink water. Ian Wright, who chairs the Commons Business Committee, fears other companies are doing the same. We see in this report, um, looking at Sports Direct, <coughs> some of the, the uh, deplorable conditions when it comes to workers' rights, with no dignity given to workers uh, whatsoever. Um, it's a bad example but I don't think it's the only example. Well, he appeared before the House of Commons Committee. He appeared before the Business, Innovation and Skills Select Committee. And he was, he said, frank and forthright. He has now been condemned almost unreservedly. The man in question is billionaire Mike Ashley. He's been running sports direct, apparently, like a Victorian workhouse. It's been compared to a gulag. He's built his success on a business model, said MPs in their conclusion, that treats workers with neither dignity nor respect. That report also outlined appalling working practices and also the fact that human beings were effectively reified, treated as things, as objects, as commodities, rather than as human beings. We had reports of one female employee so worried about being uh, given a black mark for taking time off work, she actually gave birth in the warehouse lavatories. Joining us now is Unite, the union's community coordinator, Dave Condliffe. Good morning, Dave. Con Condiffle, I do apologise. OK, Paul. Good morning, Paul. So is it Condliffe or Condiffle? It's Condliff. I do apologise. Thank you very much. I've got it written down wrong. Okay. Now, um, let's start with how this might have come about. How, were you aware of real problems with Sports Direct before things seemed to get so badly out of hand? Well, we've been sort of aware of the last 18 months since we started this campaign, and we were alarmed by some of the stories coming outside of Sports Direct. But, it's, I mean, the, what this report has come out is basically exploitation of workers on an endemic scale. You, I mean, you've talked about all the cases that are well documented now. And so what we have in workplaces like Sports Direct is workers, um, at the heart of the issue, said employees' inability to raise concerns. Well, well it's because they're feared of losing their job. I mean, how could a woman go into work and to ask a line manager for, for a reason to go home because she's feeling ill? And, and the, the reason she can't go home is because she doesn't feel she's going to get any hours the following week. She gives birth in the toilet. That level of fear, I mean, we cover employees across every sector in the UK, and we've never seen that level of fear in the workplace. Now, um, we've also had, though, a slight kind of element of praise in this report, because the, the chair of the committee, Mr Ian Wright, who's the Labour MP for Hartlepool, said he welcomed moves by Mr Ashley to engage with your union, Unite. What yes. form has that engagement taken, and are you satisfied with it? So we were in an initial dialogue with uh, Mike Ashley Sports Direct, and what we're trying to say to uh, Mr Ashley Sports Direct is, I mean, the report also sort of, like I say, it condemns the role that the agencies are playing. Um, Sports Direct pays £50 million to the two agencies' best connections and transline. I mean, they've been accused of giving false evidence and misleading the committee with these dubious insurance schemes. So obviously our dialogue with Mike Ashley is around, like I say, working with the HMRC on the accusations of non-payment of the national minimum wage. But more importantly, we want these employees to be valued. We want them to move into fixed hour permanent contracts. There's no reason to employ four 4,000 people through these agencies when you can guarantee workers on average between 32 and 39 hours per week. Do you think we need to change the law though because there's nothing illegal about zero hours contracts, there's nothing illegal about using contract staff about dealing with agencies, should that now change or at the very least be monitored more closely? Uh, most definitely, I mean what we've seen is legal minimum standards are difficult to enforce if you haven't got the backing of the trade union. We've seen that for three or four years, 4,000 workers not paid the national minimum wage. So it's evident. So we would call on government to support our campaign, the MPs report, and actually make zero hour, outlaw zero hour contracts. And let's get, I mean, at the heart of all this work exploitation is precarious work contracts, whether that be a casualisation, zero hours, temporary contracts. People don't know where their next day's work's coming from. So this is power imbalance between employees and employers. And without trade unions, it's going to continue. By the same token, though, we've also got a situation where, apart from the pain, pain below the minimum wage, or the, as it's now called, the living wage, which was in part mm -hmm. because people had to kind of queue on their own time to clock out, so their hours over a week did add up, it was still below the minimum wage. One of the other bigger concerns here seems to be about who's managing the place, who's in charge of this kind of thing, and whether or not it was a conscious decision to have that level of fear in there. Well, that, I mean, it must go to the top, this culture. I mean, this employment model, I mean, it's, we've raised concerns to the shareholder group, and that, I mean, with the public have spoken, the shareholders have spoken, the share price has gone from £8 to £2.70 in the last 12 months, the valuation's halved, and their profits have been hit. 
So, I mean, it's a concern to everybody, the, the people who work there, the shareholders, ourselves. We want um, sports reps to get back into the FTSE 100 and be a successful com uh, company. We just want it to treat its workers fairly and with respect. I mean, I suppose the, uh, if you're paying £50 million to contract agencies, if you diverted some of that to your workforce, then the problem could be solved. Most definitely just a small amount of that, but I mean, if I'm paying £50 million to agencies, I want them to do a decent job. I don't want them to tell lies to the business select committee. I don't want to set up a dubious insurance schemes or charge workers £10 for setting up a bank account and then charge them again for drawing their own wages out. So I think it'll do Mike Ashley a big favour if he moves these workers into permanent contracts. And when I first entered the world of work, it was some time ago now, it was almost... De rigueur, a matter of course that you would join a union, you'd be in a union. I'm still in a union um, through choice, but I do wonder whether this whole notion of unions in the workplace has been eroded over the past couple of decades. For example, I know there are some big employers, for example ASDA, which don't seem to actively encourage their staff to join unions. Well, I can only speak on the sectors that we cover, which is most in the UK. We have 1.4 million members, and, and we've seen a rise in our membership over the last few years. But this, I mean, we come back to the central point. You can have legal minimum standards with, without, with, without collective power behind that. You can't raise these very serious concerns. So we have now, like I say, we are in dialogue with the sports director. We have got members both at the warehouse and in the stores. And I hope today is start of meaningful negotiations where we can at the, at the AGM on September the 7th, address the press and just say, look, we're working together to right all these wrongs and we've got constructive dialogue and we've we moved workers into permanent contracts. I mean, that's our vision. I'm sure that's Mark Ashley's vision. Now, do you think this needs to be addressed urgently by the government? We had Jeremy Corbyn this week campaigning, talking, I must admit at the time, in a rather dry manner, mm -hmm. I thought, about the need for more protection for workers, workers' legislation. This now has dragged that back into the limelight, kicking and screaming, but there are concerns that when we leave the EU, then our laws won't necessarily cover the kind of protection that workers enjoy at the moment. Well, that is a concern, and that's why we campaign to remain in the EU. Um, but we're out of, like I say, the decision's been made now. So what we have to make sure is that the UK legislation covers workers' rights. And I think, I think the time is right. I think uh, Theresa May and the Conservative government should look at this very closely. And I think um, workers in the UK would obviously welcome an outlawing of zero-hour contracts. We need to put security back in the workplace. I mean, if you're on a zero-hours contract and you don't know where your hours are coming from, it's very difficult to even get a loan or even get a mortgage. And so how are we expecting people to partake in civil society when they're exploited to that degree, even when they're in work? Of course, some people do, and we've spoken to them on this station, they do actually enjoy or, or they need to, they say, work zero-hours contract. For example, we took a call from somebody who claimed she was working a few months back or a couple of weeks ago at the um, Derbyshire Warehouse for Sports Direct. She's an actor in her main career. She's often between jobs, so she likes the flexibility of a zero-hours contract. So we shouldn't phase them out altogether, maybe. No, I think we should. Where, where the work is guaranteed... I mean, this is not a corner shop, as it's Sports Direct. It knows what its turnover is going to be year by year. It knows its workflow. And the agency gave us, I mean, the agencies gave us evidence. On average, workers do between 32 and 39 hours per week. So there's no reason not to put these workers on permanent contracts. But zero-hour contracts do, I mean, they do suit a small, a small body of people. But what we're seeing now, after having zero-hour contracts for a number of years, is the rise, I think we're about over 3 million people in temporary contracts. And I think it's gone the other way now. I think it's swung, it's swung to exploitation. And the, the average amount of time people on a zero-hour contract for is, zero, is six years. And suddenly you go into a job, you should move from zero-hour contract onto a permanent contract. That so would be a natural progression. Six years is a long time to be a temporary worker anyway, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's very, I mean, I mean we, have, uh, we have, obviously, um, workers at Sports Direct that have been working for agencies for four and five years doing the same job and they should be on a permanent contract. Thank you for your time this morning. That was Dave Conliffe there, the Unite Union's community coordinator, talking to me, Paul Ross, on Talk Radio. Coming up.